Amen. Good morning. <clears throat> um, really excited. I'm nervous. You know, when uh, I, I really care about doing a good job, then I get nervous. So uh, anyway, today we're going to talk about uh, something very dear to my heart, very exciting. But I want to mention this before I forget. At the end of the service, we're going to have uh, a time of prayer, and it's going to be two things. We're going to kind of have an altar call related to uh, our topic today that I'll introduce in just a second. And then also, we're just going to piggyback off what Scott did. We're going to ask everybody that's here that's going to YFN to gather over in this corner, and everybody that wants to gather around them and just uh, lay hands on them and pray for them, we want to do that at the end. So we'll have two things going. We'll kind of have an altar call. If anything in this message uh, speaks to you and you feel the Lord moving, and we'll pray for uh, our YFN group over there. Okay? So what are we going to talk about today? Today we're talking about uh, cross-cultural missions. And we're going to have some guests up here and some awesome stories and when we start off a message like this, I always have a uh, fear that some people are like cross-cultural missions, like or the mission field. I'm never going on the mission field, therefore I should tune out. So this is my best attempt to say, don't do that, and here's why. A couple reasons. One, we need every person in the room to be on the team of our missions outreach. And we'll talk about some of the different ways, but we need you on the team, number one. Number two, some of you are called to cross-cultural missions, but bigger than that, every person in the room is called to a mission. You're all called to a mission. For some of you, that mission is showing hospitality. For some of you, that mission is being people of mercy. You're like, well, what, what's a person of mercy? You know, you're going through a difficult time. You share with some people, and you can tell they're not paying attention. You share your difficulty with a person of mercy, and you're like, I've been heard. I've been ministered to. And that's a gift of the Lord. The list of of ministries is as long as the people in the room here. But every person is called to ministry. So the first thing I want to do is uh, mention a verse. I'm just going to quote it instead to read it because I don't have a, I had to move that pulpit thing away. First Peter 4.10 says that each of you should use your gift to serve the body of Christ. Each person has been given a gift. So if there's anybody out here today that says, well, I don't have a gift, you know, that means you've not discovered it, or you've buried it, or you're afraid of it. But the Word of God says that each person has a gift, and they should use it to serve the body of Christ. So that, number one. Number two, I want to talk about cross-cultural missions for a second before we bring up my first, uh, I've got rock star guests today, but before we bring up the first ones, uh, what does cross-cultural missions mean? It means leaving your culture, going to a different culture, and that can look a lot of different ways, but... Um, so, you know, sometimes that means for us going to a foreign country, okay? That's kind of the easiest example. But it could also be you jumping into a prison ministry where you're all of a sudden with people who are like, I'm in a different world. I just stepped into a different world. That also can be an example of a cross-cultural mission. Uh, or it could be you uh, ministering to going to a part of St. Louis where everybody's different than you. You know, uh, where going to a, a group of uh, Hispanic people, you're the only person that's not Hispanic. Now, you've just stepped into cross cultural missions. Same thing with African American communities. There's just a long list of things 
uh, where that could happen. But why is that important? Okay, just a couple quick things. I want you to think about your Bible stories here, and I want to just reference three or four people real quick. Abraham in the Old Testament, huge figure, the father of our faith. The first thing that God says to Abraham is, leave your father's household and go to a land I'm going to show you. Number one, sometimes we don't think about that. Number one, leave your culture and I'm going to do something powerful through you. Okay, that's a good example. Then I want to bring up two figures in the Old Testament who were the right-hand man of world leaders. One was Joseph, who served uh, the Pharaoh of Egypt and saved the the land from uh, famine. You know the story. The other is Daniel, who was the right-hand man of Babylonian and Persian leaders. Both these people uh, became the trusted person, and they were both completely out of their culture. Think about this. Joseph had to go. He had to learn a different language. He had to learn all the culture of the Egyptians. And he did it so well that when his flesh and blood brothers came to him, they could not recognize him. They could not recognize him because he knew the language so well and he was so into the culture. When when he finally said, I'm Joseph, they're, they're like, no, you're not. Same thing for Daniel. Daniel goes, how many languages did Daniel know? We don't know, but he served both Babylonians and Persian leaders as a trusted, high-level government official, all of that outside of his culture. Okay, the last one I want to mention is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul describes himself as a Hebrew of Hebrews. He lists it. I mean, you know this. This is in the book of Philippians. He lists all the things, you know, that he was uh, circumcised on such and such a day, and he studied this, and he knew that, and he, he just had the list. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, and God saves him. We know the story on that. He's on the way to Damascus. God saves him, and on day one, God says to him, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. That is a non-starter. If you're a Hebrew of Hebrews, you avoided the Gentiles. They didn't talk to them. And Jesus says, I got a mission for you, and I'm going to send you to a different culture. So all that to say, I want you to think about that. Uh, It's important. Uh, And with that, I'm going to call up my first... uh, pair of rock stars, Ruth and Linda, would you please come up? Would you welcome them? I'm going to have you two share this mic. Okay, great. So this is Ruth Cox. And Linda Wilk, these are two friends of mine. Um, These two minister uh, in West Africa. Okay, we're just going to try to leave it vague at West Africa. We're all afraid we're going to be the person or Becky that's going to say specific countries that we're trying not to say. Um, So, uh, Ruth, yesterday we were talking on the phone And this is a story we can't go into, but I'm just going to say a sentence about it. And I encourage, by the way, all of you, sometime you need to take these two out to lunch. And and there's 15 uh, lunch topics you could have. But one could be, tell me your story of how you started in missions. Because Ruth first went and was sure God was calling her to be a missionary to China. She spent several years in China. Seven years in China. Now, part of that was uh, in Hong Kong. Part of that was in an interior part of China, learning the language. And she would say, and it's a longer story, but then everything shut down. It didn't work. Then she went to Tibet. So that's the other half of the seven years. Mm -hmm. And eventually it shut down. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. And so what happened with Amy? 
your daughter. Why don't you tell us, just give us the brief version. Finished university and um, joined the Peace Corps. Your daughter, Amy, joined the Peace Corps. And she asked for a French-speaking nation. And they sent her to a French-speaking nation. And I had to look it up on the map. I I never heard of it because it's, it's a small, rather isolated, unknown nation. And so I came home sick, frustrated, discouraged, but I thought I was going back to China. But I wanted to go visit my daughter. I hadn't seen her for a year and a half, and so I did. And a couple of weeks into that, God was pulling at my heart for the country that she was in. And um, now, in it, am I going go too ahead. fast? No, no. Came go ahead. back, came back home, and asked permission from. Then it was Vic, who Vic was, Gerson, who was here, was the pastor that I would like to go and um, serve in Africa. And his response was, "I knew that." that God was calling you there. I'm going, well, why didn't you tell me? (laughs) (laughs) That's a real confirmation, though, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah. But I think I remember you saying that when you first went to go see your daughter Amy in Africa, that you told her, now, listen, I'm coming, but don't think I'm going to stay here. Oh, yeah. Absolutely not. Well, I had just begun to get a grasp of of Chinese. (laughs) Just begun to learn culture. And, and then I'm thinking, oh, well, this will be an easy transition. I've done this for seven years. Well, it's not. <laughs> so then you went to Africa, mm-hmm. starting in what year? Um, 2000, April of 2000. So you've been in Africa now 24 years. Yeah. That's it's, awesome. It's, I have um, children and grandchildren in Africa. <laughs> been there long enough for that yeah so tell us tell us the highlights of what you ladies do in Africa okay. you go. all right um, a big part of our work in Africa is a sponsorship program and we have currently we have it's always fluid but we have about 45 widows and about 250 children that are in our sponsorship program and uh, we take care of uh, the widow's uh, physical needs. We uh, bring them food. We provide medicine for them. And sometimes we even rebuild houses uh, when they fall down after the heavy rains. And the main goal of the child sponsorship program is to keep them in school, to get an education, but we also provide food and, and medical uh, aid for them as well. Because public education still cost in this country. Yes, the, the public education, uh, there is a tuition fee, which is small, but um, many families cannot afford that. So there are children who just are not sent to school or are, have to drop out of school. There's also a program that we partner with. Uh, it's a girls uh, program, girls that have had difficulty in school have not been able to succeed, and sometimes their family is ready to give them in marriage. And so it's a program where they can learn skills, sewing and weaving and animal husbandry and gardening and something that they can bring with them and provide an income for their family. They're given uh, either a loom or a sewing machine at the end of the program, and so we're trying to get them started to, to have some success. That's awesome. Now, about these 45 widows and these 200 some odd school children, you're also uh, providing food to each of those families as well. Absolutely. Yes, that's a big part of the program is to to feed them. You know, they're they're hungry. They're many of them are malnourished. The children can't learn um, if they're not fed. To, to go to school. So yes, yeah, we feed them, we provide medical care. And often, you know, our, our national person uh, in our country will contact us with a specific need and see if there's some way that we can meet that need for that person. And so we, we never know what's going to be asked of us, but we try to find a way to provide for that. And 
you know, I said that the program, the number in the program is fluid. Uh, we have 45 widows. We have probably 20 widows that are waiting for a sponsor. Wow. We have uh, 250 children. We have many children that have 75. waited, about 75 children that are still waiting to be sponsored. So there, there's always a great need. So some people out here sitting thinking, what could they do? They could sponsor a widow. They could sponsor a child. Right. And for each of those families, they're actually supporting the entire, the entire family. family. So you two ladies are helping, by the grace of God, to support 250 at least families in one of the poorest nations in Africa. Right. And some of the children... I love the way she just glossed over that. <laughs> Well, some of the children who are in the sponsorship program are also uh, have some disabilities. Uh, we have some children who are blind, and we would see them when we would be in our village, and they, they had no purpose. They kind of just sat in the sand all day, and uh, wow. so we found a, a school that would yeah. accept these children who are blind, and we, it's, it's been very encouraging uh, to us to see them thrive. We've had some uh, deaf girls in particular that we have sent to a school for the deaf who uh, have trans, kind of transitioned into a sewing school. And to see the confidence of one of the, our young ladies who was up at the chalkboard drawing a pattern and you know, to see her in my mind back when she was like sitting in the sand and now when she was in front of a whole group demonstrating her skills, uh, it just kind of makes That's your heart incredible. smile. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Ruth, what else do you guys do? We, a major project is we build churches and we coordinate with a local pastor who is our main contact and another pastor who is our contractor. And we have built 37 churches. Excuse me? 37. You've built 37 churches. Yes. Well... Not me, not me with my hands, but let's say that God has provided the means to build 35. 30. We, we, we have 37. We have four uh, that are construction is going to start in the next couple of weeks. Mm. Um, another major project is drilling for water. How many wells do you think you've helped put in? 35. That's 35 good wells. That's we since when? Um, what, the last 12 years? Yeah, and then before that, you also put in a lot of wells. Well, m maybe four or five. Okay. Four or five up and in the north. And yeah. Not, them too. And then we've refurbished 12 wells. Like, the, they go in and they test the, the water source. If there's a good water source, uh, we replace the pump and the, yeah. The thingies. The in, the, the, <laughs> we're, Scott, we may need... The, the, the internal... Oh, okay. <laughs> the internal the, part, yeah. The internal parts. And, um, Scott can give us the terms for those later. Okay, yeah. Okay. And we, and we build a wall around uh, the pump, keep the animals out, keep the water pure. Um, yeah, it's kind of what we do. That's, that's amazing. So there's, there's so much more that these ladies could share of what they do. But, um, okay... Before we go to our next rock star, why do you do this? <laughs> he said he was going to ask that. <laughs> That's a hard question. It's a really hard question. Um, when, when, when the Lord is, is tugging on your heart with something like this, I, you know, I, I had a couple of courses at Bible school. I had a couple of classes in cross-cultural living. I, that's really all. And, and so you, what do you do with this thing that's on your heart? You know, I, I, just, I just started, I'm kind of a fighter. I don't know if you know that. Well, yeah. And so I just started knocking at every door that I could find, answering every email that I could find, looking into every organization, and doors didn't open. It wasn't the timing. It wasn't the right timing. But I kept trying and trying to. I got to the place of, God, I'll, I'll go anywhere. Surely there's something that I can do for you. 
when, when you have this on your heart, this love in your heart, and you're, you're, loving, you're loving Jesus, and there's got to be something I can do for you. Won't you send me? Can't, can't I go? And you just keep knocking, and you keep trying. And I, I tried the doors, and then finally the door to China opened. And it, it seemed like it was defeat. I left discouraged, and I, and I didn't go back. But it was not. It, it was successful work in ministry. I knew that if I could touch one heart, if I could change one life, introduce Jesus to one person, that, that I was successful. And then when I made that change, again, it, it's like I, I, I didn't have a clear vision and, and I, I'd be frustrated because some missionaries, they know from day one, I'm going to go here and I'm going to do this. I, I don't know if my brain doesn't work that way, but I didn't hear the Lord. I don't know. All I knew was I want to go. And I know there's something there that I can do. And I never had a visions of any great accomplishment. But can I give a cup of cold water? to someone in your name. Can I be your hands and your feet? And um, he is faithful. He is faithful. We, even when we don't understand, we don't know what's going on, he connects the dots and puts it all together and makes it work in ways that we can't even imagine and we can't do it. That's why I go. I'm kind of the flip side of that coin. <laughs> I had no intention of going anywhere than where I was happily in Massachusetts. But then I visited Africa. I thought I was visiting it. And then I went home and for eight years I said, I'm not going, but I'll do this. I'll help out this way, but you, certainly you can't mean me. That's probably the person Kevin was referring to sitting uh, in the audience saying, yeah, I'm too old. They're not, he's not talking about me because I'm too old and I'm settled and I'm doing all this. But God is a relentless God, and yeah. he never let go of that pull and... I was teaching school at the time in a similar situation where Ruth said people said to her they knew that she was going to Africa. Well, I did projects in, in our school to help raise funds for the orphanage and various things like that. And then finally, one well, it's a long story, but one day when I visited Africa, it became quite clear to me that I needed to go. And when I went back home, I remember this one time talking to the lunch lady, and I told her, guess what, I'm going to Africa. She said, we all knew you were going, we just were waiting for you to make up your mind. So, you know, I guess, I guess my message is, you know, you're never too old to, to just listen and respond. And then the, the other question, I think, is why do we go? But the, I think another part of that is, why do we go back? Um, it's not always easy. It's sometimes you get discouraged. It's not glamorous. Uh, but when you see the face of that child, that blind child, that you've been able to provide a space in the school for him, and you visit him and he follows you out to your car and puts his hand on your arm and says, thank you, you go back. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to help you down. <laughs> All right. And would uh, Becky Schrader please come? Uh, let's welcome Becky. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love the Winpoint A Project shirt. Becky, it's great to see you. So we're just going to jump right in with you, Becky. Tell us what you do. By the way, Ruth was a mentor for you. Is that right? Yeah, I actually visited her when I was 17. And uh, 
I stayed with her for four months there. And so that was kind of like the bug, I guess. <laughs> Got you. And, and you've always known exactly what you wanted to do and what the path would look like, right? No. <laughs> so I know you've been through a number of different things. And, uh, but, so God has really led you now to a fruitful ministry. I want you to tell us about it. Yeah, so the Wimpoide Project, uh, we get to work with sick and terminally ill children. Um, Sick and terminally ill. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about in one of the poorest countries of the world, the healthcare situation doesn't even hold a candle to what we think of. Yeah. Um, so we get to help with surgeries, medication, food, um, and helping navigate what does this look like for them? Um, what are the resources that we have available? What in-country can we do um, and help? Uh, yeah, in every type of situation, heart, brain, um, cerebral palsy, kind of just any, anything and everything. And similar to Ruth and Linda, would it be fair to say that without the ministry you give, often these children are just sitting in the dirt in their compound with, and mom and dad have no option. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of times when uh, the children there have unique needs, um, they can be considered a curse. Um, and a lot of times families can either um, get rid of them or get rid of the mom. And so um, they can, um, or also just be left as uh, the child becomes a burden to the You're family. saying sometimes the family will abandon this mother and child because... Or, or just child or just mother, yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. So we get to meet. Do you want we, to show the video? Yeah, let's show a video. Let's show the yeah. video. That's how you learn It's nothing short of a miracle I'm here I think it over and it doesn't matter I know it comes from above I've got miracles on miracles A million little miracles Miracles on miracles, count your miracles, one, two, three, four, I can't even count them all. Uh, you held me steady so I wouldn't give up. You opened doors that nobody could shut. I hope I never get over what you've done. That's powerful. Let's tell us about the partnership. Yeah, so we started a neuro a neurosurgery partnership this year. Um, it had been a year of like dreaming and timing and um, so we have the head of neurosurgery in all of this West African country um, partnering with us and helping us navigate um, cases that are neurospecific. And so um, because of your support, um, we have been able to have three successful surgeries to date. Um, so, uh, two of them had hydrocephalus where a shunt was placed, 
Um, and one has hydrocephalus where a shunt was placed in spina bifida, and so they did the closing of the spine. Um, and so what's beautiful about it is um, by medical expenses sake comparable to here, it's significantly cheaper, about maybe $5,000 per surgery. Um, $5,000 for a whole, that's the whole bill for whole a surgery? Bill. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Follow up, all that stuff, yeah. Um, and so, but when you live in this country and you make, we'll say a good salary of $10 a day, uh, $5,000 isn't possible. And so you make that possible. And, So you've, in the last couple of years, it said something like 34 families, and then it said, and seven have gone to be with Jesus. I know that must be incredibly difficult to walk through. Yeah. Um, let's change the subject. Please. I, I hear that it's really easy to go to Africa because it's so comfortable and... You never miss holidays with your family. Would you tell me about that? Yeah, uh, I was actually telling Kevin uh, yesterday, he was like, you know, tell people how great it is, missions. And I was like, well, if I'm going to be like fully transparent with my family, it sucks sometimes. Um, I know. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, but it's... It's 112 degrees, power outages, generators blowing up, um, insecurity, um, the unknown, missing your family, missing holidays, life events. and Why would you do that? But God. <laughs> um, I wouldn't, in all honesty. I love the United States. I love getting my nails done and my hair done. And... Um, and but um, when the Lord asks and there's a tender response, then he does. And there's grace for it, even through the tears with your mom. It's fantastic. Uh, so. You have a big fundraiser today, which makes me think of a couple things. One is, uh, I talked earlier about everybody's on the team. Everybody's on the team. Uh, if you give $10 a month, that's awesome, or $100 a month, or whatever. That is such a huge part of being on the team. Another thing the team members need is uh, intercessors, people that will pray for them because... Uh, Everything is intense. Everything is difficult. The things Becky just talked about. Prayer is so important. Uh, and the last thing, also, like, I just think it's super easy to think of help with finances, uh, help with, um, um, what was the other thing I said? Prayer. Prayer, thank you. And then the last one I want to say is, you know what these people really need that so often they don't get is somebody that will regularly try to encourage them. Send them an email, make a phone call. Do you know all these people? You can call them with WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, and they don't get enough phone calls, I'm telling you. Encouragement's a huge deal. Now, the last thing I want to ask you about, so you've got the Winpoint A fundraiser today. We hope that goes awesome. Uh, you told me that power outages this past time you were there were so severe, you're laying in bed in the middle of the night, it's still over 100 degrees in the room, you can't sleep, and it was pretty discouraging. I had tapped out. <laughs> I was like, I'm done. The Lord is take me. <laughs> I'm going. Yeah, uh, something broke somewhere, and uh, so power, we had 12-hour power outages for weeks and weeks and weeks, and it just was brutal, and it was my tapping point. Now, somebody could fix this today. There's not a lot of things you can fix, but $2,000 would give her the solar setup so that one room stays cool, and $3,500 would solar power her entire house. Somebody could fix this today. Um, 
Becky, what you do is incredible. I'm so appreciative. I'm so honored to be on the team. Uh, last things? Yeah, um, you make this happen. It's not me. It's I couldn't do it without you. And our church is a gift. And um, Ruth and Linda and I and uh, the Rosensteels and the Miles and stuff, we couldn't do it without you. Um, and so really, this, what we've been able to accomplish over the last year or 24 years is because of a generous, generous church family. That And so thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thanks. Would our next rock star come forward, Morgan? Hey, as Morgan's coming forward, um, uh, Becky referenced uh, the Rosensteels, who are, though retired from on-the-field ministry, are still working full-time with uh, language interpretation, uh, giving the Word of God to people in their own language. You guys raise your hands, wave. So an, another great couple. Uh, Matt Black right now is in Greece. You all know that uh, if you've been around, you know that Matt Black was 20 years in Turkey until he was kicked out of the country of Turkey. And it was just reiterated to him by the government again, even though he hasn't been there in five years, that we don't ever want you back. <laughs> and uh, that's a whole story. And so Matt is working in Greece, and he found all these pockets of Turkish-speaking people, and most of them have never heard the story of Jesus. So that's what Matt is doing in, in Greece. And uh, Becky referenced Rachel and Terry Miles that are ministering uh, to deaf communities in Southeast Asia. It's powerful what they're doing. So, and of course, you know, Brother Abraham was just here. Many of you work with Oasis Ministry that... Um, that we uh, partner with. Thrive is another ministry we partner with. And we still support in a small way uh, the Townsends that were the first people in Guatemala where we did short-term missions trips starting in the 80s. This church has a rich history of ministering on short-term trips. And it's funny, in Guatemala was a part of that. And we're still connected with the Townsends. And where the Townsends were, eventually that door kind of closed. So we had some years where we didn't go to Guatemala. And now that door has opened again. And uh, that's why our good friend Morgan Blankenship's up here. She's going to tell us a little bit about that. As well as Morgan has a rich history of working in missions with YWAM. Welcome, Morgan Blankenship. Yes, thank you. So, Morgan, tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about this past Guatemala team that just went. This was our second year in a row. Yes. How did it go? Fantastic. <laughs> and let me expand. <laughs> I was doing all of the organizational stuff, which isn't like a foreign thing for me. I work here in the office. I love administration, color coding, gift from God. So good. <laughs> However, I think sometimes it's easy to get in the busyness of planning and get distracted and take your eyes off like Jesus in the sense of, I have to do all of these things. All that to say, I went to Guatemala with a real trash attitude. What? I know. And what I, it's so funny, I was sharing this story with Kevin and, and Scott at an admin meeting, and they're like, that's fantastic, you should share this. And I was like, well, I look like an idiot with the story I'm about to say, <laughs> and I didn't share this with my Guatemala team. I, <laughs> so it's very humbling. I, I went with a really bad attitude. We're going to go serve the people of Guatemala and just out of the overflow of our heart, pour out to this nation. And we're going to go and it's going to be fantastic. And I'm over here. I'm like, get me out, Lord. Tap out. I'm done. I'm wow. tired. I, I don't feel well. All these people probably look at me like I'm Pippi Longstockings. I don't have anybody else to lead with me. I don't even want to be here <laughs> um, in the holiest way possible. And... <laughs> So it, it's like, you know, we get there on a Saturday, it's Sunday, but I'm like saying all the right things because I do believe it. I just wasn't feeling it. And, you know, God's worthiness isn't depict, like it isn't set because I feel it or see it. It's just he's worthy. So I can, I can say yes, even though I don't feel it. And so 
but it'd be nice to feel it as well. And so it's, you know, we get there Saturday, it's Sunday. We, we start Monday, um, ministry on Monday, and it was Monday morning. I'm having my quiet time with the Lord, and I'm like, God, I'm really sorry, but I'm, I'm struggling. I need your help. I have bad attitude. He goes, yes, you do. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and it was beautiful because how he met me was I, I never even thought to pray to have God help me with my bad attitude. It's like I left that out of the peace completely. And one by one, he went through every single person on my team, and he started giving me eyes to see them the way he sees them. And I was like, whoa, I forgot you, like, answer prayers. I for, like, I don't know how I forgot that you move, that you meet me, that, you're, that you want the people on this team to, like, encounter you, how much more do you want also the people that we're loving on in Guatemala to encounter you and to see you and for us to love? And so he fixed my heart, which was great, because the team did fantastic. We partnered with their um, abuelitos, like their older folk, lovely, you know, oldie but goodies. And we had, we did a sports camp where we got to go into, like, the public schools and share gospel messages. And we were able to go and do, like, a KOV-like program, which was so interesting. <laughs> And so good, and, and there was just so many beautiful things, and get to go into people's homes. The team did fantastic. They wanted to, like, just pour out even more, and it was beautiful because I, I genuinely believe that short-term works best when you partner with long-term missionaries. Oh, and good. so that partnership, I think, works really beautiful because when we leave, they stay there. We get yeah, to be an encouragement right. to long-termers, but also know that if we make connections, there's people that are still going to be there to continue on. That's, that's awesome. So we should uh, show your video. Before we do, everybody that went on the team, if you're in the house, stand up. There's some folks right there. There's the odd. Great. Good. All right, let's cue up that video, please. And... Uh, Let's watch about Morgan's victory dance. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, everybody hurts sometimes, I know that's what they say But right now it seems this loneliness won't go away yeah. Can anybody feel this heartache? Is anyone around? Feels like we're running round in circles, we can't catch a breath We can't enjoy the moment when we always want what's next, yeah Just when I can't take no more It's when I hear you say Don't hang your head when you get lonely There's nowhere I can hide From the one who gave his life So I could get back mine yeah. So when you can't take no more Look up and hear him say Don't hang your head when you get lonely No, I'll never leave your side And don't go thinking you're the only One that can get it right Yeah, you got my Sustains all of my life You are the one that I run to In you I am satisfied Oh, your mercy is new every morning Your grace sustains all of my life You are the one that I run to In you I am satisfied Don't hang your head when you get lonely No
That looks incredible. I forgot about the construction part too. I, I didn't personally do construction, but the lovely, I, I know. When you see me, you think she does construction, but I didn't do that. Next. So do you want to tell us something about that? Or um, the other thing I always want Morgan to do is she's had such a rich history. She's been on the mission field for so long. Um, why, why do missions? Why do you go? Why should people consider it? What, what do you want to tell us? Well, Jesus is worthy. Amen. And so, you know, it, it, like the Great Commission is, is for all of us. We go and make disciples of all nations. But, you know, like there's that beautiful thing. And um, he wants people to be salt and light. He wants people to know that they are loved. He wants us to love and to extend that. I, I think one of the ladies was like, you know, I want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. That's beautiful. Saying yes to the Lord is I think one of the best decisions anybody can make. And sometimes that looks like it interrupts your life. Sometimes it looks like being uncomfortable. Sometimes it looks like, you know, just saying yes is is the most beautiful thing you can do, I think, in obedience to what God's calling. And sometimes that looks like going to cross-cultural missions. Sometimes that as well, if you're not going, then it looks like faithfully being the one that sends people. So you were even saying that does look like giving finances. If you don't have that, then it looks like being faithful for being an intercessor. It looks like, you know, partnering with God's heart for that, because I think that's a big part of God's heart for people to know him, for the gospel to be released in all nations and all tribes and all tongues. And I think that's such a facet of God's heart as well as being faithful to where he's calling you to be. And so if that's a mom, if it's a doctor, if it's a janitor, if it's, you know, a teacher, if it's wherever it is, it's saying yes to what he's calling you to do because that w- that's glorifying the Lord and it's just as important as well as looking at his facet for heart because we're talking about missions saying, okay, that's great. If you're not sending me, then I'm going to be sending somebody else. I'm going to partner with your heart for this because it matters. And even hearing all of these testimonies, they can't do that without it. It's a beautiful thing. That's why I think we, we use it. And it's not cheesy or lighthearted to say partner. It's a partnership, and, and that's something that's so beautiful. I remember when I was living you know, full-time and doing missions, I had seasons that were very... Um, bear. And, and I was like, Lord, I don't know. Do I pay my rent or do I eat? Or like, what is this? And I remember there was this um, homeless woman and she had two pit bull dogs. And it wasn't like I was trying to be holy. I just was like on a walk. And so I was like, could I sit with you for a little bit? I really just wanted to give a cuddle to the dogs. They were super cute. And she was asking me about what I did. And I was like, yeah, I just tell people about Jesus. And I live here because I think God's awesome. That was my my explanation. And she was like, what do you do? And I led teams to mainly Southeast Asia. And so I was giving her my spiel just to like, you know, tell her. And she said, okay, how do I partner with you? And I'm like, girl, what, you, did you say she was yeah, she, homeless? Homegirl, homegirl was homeless. And I was like, I don't think, I don't know how you do that. I don't think I have a theology for, for this. And she's like, I have $10 with that. Does that count? And I'm like, oh, gosh, I don't, I was like, I could buy us some food. And she goes, no, 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 it needs to go towards your ministry. I want to partner with your ministry. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Lord, do I take this money from this homeless woman? I did. And it was one of the most beautiful things because it, it matters. She wanted to partner with this. And so people in here, I think sometimes we look at the number thinking, all I have is that. It's like the widow's might. What you have is beautiful. If you have time to pray, pray. If you have $10, give $10. If you have a grand or the ability to give Becky money for her air. Like, that seems so silly, but those things matter. Do you know what I mean? And sometimes we don't see it, but you can't do prayer without, like, you can't do missions without prayer. And you also can't do it without finances. <laughs> that helps too. But it's like, God, and also like, God, what do you want me to do? Like, actually have this conversation and know that he wants to tell you. He wants to talk to you. He wants to partner with you, partner with other people. And so ask the Lord, get him involved in it and be like, okay, what do you want me to do? Do I give money? Do I pray? Is it for this ministry? Is it for this missionary? But being intentional with, this is my resources, this is my time, what do I do with that? And I want to come back to something you've touched on a couple times with the homeless 
person you mentioned, and also even how you started off this Guatemala trip this time. In the midst of you doing this, you find God ministering to you and touching your heart and, and helping work on your issues and growing you. Praise God we don't have a word. It's, I really wish I was perfect. I know that's probably a sin, but I wish I was all together and had it all. <laughs> I wish I was the bee's knees. Apparently, God can use you in spite, despite yourself, and that's what's so beautiful. You actually don't have to have it all together. You just have to be willing and to say yes. You don't have to have it all together to go. Is that Amen. what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. I think Becky said that, too. You don't have to have She's it all smart together lady. to go. <laughs> Amen. Just say yes. Just say yes. It's an awfully big adventure. Just say it. So, you know, sometimes I've been in this spot. Sometimes what that means is like, yeah, God, I think you're saying this, and I have no idea what to do, but I'm saying yes. Yeah. That's important, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. You're awesome. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> Brad Markham. Where's my final rock star, Brad Markham? Here he comes. <laughs> Welcome. I'm not a friend. Have a seat for just a second, and then I, I know you might want to stand and say something, too, because I'm going to have Brad give a little of his heart to end. He can do that from sitting or standing, whatever you yeah, want. I'll just sit. But, Brad, That's you fine. just got back from a trip. Yes, and I, I, while it's close to Ruth, it's a different country, so I can mention it's Ghana. Um, and that's pretty much exclusively where I'm focused right now, although the ministry I'm working with is actually uh, reaching into four other countries. And so we're working with about 1,500 churches, and it's so what did you what did you do in Ghana? And I, I heard you took Jim Meany with you this Jim time. Jim Meany and oh, yeah. Jeff Fox went with me uh, on this trip. And uh, we were teaching uh, up in northern Ghana. We're dealing with what they call missionaries. So we're at a missionary school, which are uh, young guys that have decided that they want to go to uh, villages where there are no churches and start churches. And so they go out and do church planting. And so we were with them, probably 60 or so uh, young guys and girls, actually. And, and you were teaching and training. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I was there in February, and then this a couple weeks ago, we just got back. I'll be back in September again. Fantastic. And... Uh, yeah, so we've been teaching a lot of different topics from pastoral theology to ecclesiology to uh, biblical theology, this next time hermeneutics, uh, yeah, systematic theology. So, yeah, just guys, uh, these missionaries, and then up in the, in, the, in the southern part, up in the mountains, we're dealing with uh, about 65 pastors and uh, what, what it is is that during the pandemic, they were forced to close down their Bible college. And so we're trying to come behind and catch those men up that are, you know, now active full time in ministry. So, so you were reaching out to 60 some church planters and some 60, 65 pastors. That's so correct. That's tremendous impact. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's exciting. Working with a ministry called GlobeServe, which is uh, uh, led by Sam Dunya, who is a Ghanaian, and it's a, a Ghanaian ministry. And uh, yeah, it's exciting. And uh, actually, we were training some missionaries that are going into the country where Ruth and Linda are. And so that was fun, too, to awesome. touch base with them. Awesome. So, yeah. So I'm going to ask you to wrap us up here in a second. Um, but before I do, I just want to remind some of you know this, some of you don't, that 30-plus uh, years ago, it was Brad teaching on missions that Ruth would say that's what helped her have the heart and the theology to launch, as would Matt Black. They, they both point at you and say, uh, you helped send me. 
Yeah, that, you know, I would say this, that the most important and fruitful thing I think I've ever done in ministry is pastoring Ruth and pastoring Matt and watching what God has done through them. And uh, wow. I did want to mention, too, you mentioned Matt. I, so he contacted me yesterday. He's actually preaching. I guess he's probably done by now, but he was preaching in a Turkish congregation this morning in Greece. That's and fantastic. So, yeah, pretty neat. So, Brad, what? why has God designed missions? Why has he made it work like that? What's in God's heart about this? Well, let, let me, I, I feel like I need to say this. This is going to embarrass Kevin and Sheila, but they, it needs to be said. And that is, and I think I can speak freely uh, for Ruth, Linda, Becky, Amy, um, Matt, that uh, I don't know that there's better missionary pastors than Kevin and Sheila and what they do. It's amazing. And uh, their, their care for those who are working in missions and their uh, willingness to visit in the field and be supportive is just incredible. And I know that takes them away from this congregation some, but I'm telling you, it's very worthwhile. I've been with them, and I know the impact that they make, and I, I just wanted to say that. Um, and I'm going to say a, a couple of things that Kevin mentioned earlier, but maybe emphasize them a little bit more, and that is, you know, when I look at the scriptures, I think I see um, four different great commissions um, I think the first one was when God told Adam and Eve to multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. And they failed in that mission, which required then another great commission, which was a second Adam, which is Jesus Christ, who came to fulfill the failure of, of the first Adam. And he came sent by the Father and then he has commissioned us now as the Father sent me, so send I you. And so I see that as a commission. But another, and I want to contrast these two for just a moment. And so I see a great commission when God called Abraham. And he called him from his convenience, his home, his land, and God told him to go. And I'd like to, just because I, I have it here, I want this is in the New King James. I want to use the, the language of New King James. This is Genesis chapter 12 and uh, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, and I love this, get out of your country from your family and your father's house to a land that I will show you. And then verse 3, the summary of that. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. But I love the way New King James says that. Get out. Um, you know, we can use the softer term go. But really God was telling Abraham, get out and get away and go and do what I've called you to do. Now, I want to, I want to take this other the Great Commission that we're familiar with in Matthew 18, and I want to insert the language from Genesis. Matthew 28. This is Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, get out of your country from your family and your father's house and go make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I think sometimes we forget that the Great Commission is actually a great commandment. And in fact, it is technically a commandment of the Lord to go, to get out, to share the gospel, to take, if you will, the kingdom of God into the earth. And that sometimes we forget that. Not only is it 
a great commission and a great commandment. It is a prophecy. Jesus was prophesying, and we see that clearer in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, when Jesus prophesies, and he says that they were to tarry until they're endued with power from on high, and that when that power came, that they would go. They would be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. It is a prophetic declaration of Jesus Christ of the glory of God to fill the earth because he is worthy and he's do it. And so, you know, I find that a lot of times as Christians, we're uncomfortable with the idea that Jesus commands us to do anything. It's really more, well, I want to feel led. I, I want to... I want to have some mysterious encounter with God that moves me from my place of inaction. But really, I, I think Matt says this well. He often likes to say that unless you have received some kind of exception from the Holy Spirit, the revealed will of God is to go. The revealed will of God is to share the revealed will of God is to be a witness and that none of us ever are called to just sit. We are called to go. And part of that go um, is that we are to be witnesses to those who are near, but part of it is also to be part of those who are sent to the foreign lands. And I can tell you with... Uh, what what experience I've had in missions is that it's very difficult. It can be very lonely to be on the field. And you know that people love you, but you don't know if they care about what you're doing. And that that's important that we encourage those who have gone. But also, and I know this for a fact, the hardest thing, the worst thing, the most uncomfortable thing is asking for the funds to go, but that really is part of our calling here. Uh, Romans 10, you know, it, it iterates to us, it speaks to us, and it says that um, in order for people to get saved, there has to be someone who's willing to go, someone who's willing to preach. But then verse I believe it's verse 15 of Romans 10 says this, but how can they go except they are sent? And I think very often we think that concept of being sent means except God sends them. But really the scriptures are clear that we are all sent. And it's true that we do need God to specifically say, here's where I want you to go. But I think a big part of the responsibility of sending those who are called to preach is for us to realize that we, as the community of believers, play the largest role in making sure that those individuals who have been sent are enabled. And it's for us to commission them. It's for us to affirm them. And it's for us to financially support them. And so... I just want to encourage you in that and say this church has an amazing history of being faithful in that. And kind of like Paul would say, I would say to you, let's do that more and more and more because it's worthwhile. Amen. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Brett.